Okay, so uh, going over the review, question number 11 is the first one I came across that, that could have been better. Uh, so it says, which statement describes a chemical property with the element magnesium? Um, so remember that a chemical property is going to be something that can only be tested by a chemical change. Um, and so generally, chemical properties aren't really undone very easily. Um, so let's look at the option choices. Magnesium will react with acids. Magnesium is easy to bend and shape. Magnesium is a high boiling point, And magnesium conducts electricity. Uh, and so what I'll point out with B, C, and D, all three of these I can test. But after I get done testing, I still have magnesium left. Um, it hasn't really changed. I'm either bent it. I've boiled it into a, a gas, or I've seen if it can conduct electricity, but it should still be magnesium at the end. Um, the only one that really describes a chemical reaction um, where I'm doing like some chemistry is number A, or not number A, letter A. Uh, magnesium will react with acids. That is a chemical reaction. If I put magnesium and an acid in a beaker together, the acid is going to dissolve the magnesium. And when I'm done and I know that they will react, that magnesium is gone. It's turned into something else. It's dissolved away. So it, it should be A for question 11. Let's see. Next one I saw on the list was question 21. Uh, oh, and let's say this. Stop me if you've got something you want to go over. Because um, these I just got off the, the, the reviews. Uh, so if there's something specifically you'd like to go over, let me know and I'll do that right away. So 21, given the speed of light, which they give you, and the wavelength, which they give you, what is the frequency? And then they give you the formula. C is equal to F times lambda. Um, so that is a very simple formula. And all we have to do for that is just to rearrange it. Um, so I'm going to take this formula here and solve for frequency, which is what they want my answer to be. So if I come over here to the board... The formula is C is equal to F times lambda, which is the upside down Y. And to get the frequency by itself, I want to dissolve or divide the lambda to the other side. Um, and so if I divide by lambda on both sides, then these two lambdas cancel out. And what I get is just the frequency by itself now is equal to the speed of light divided by lambda. So that's my new formula that I want to solve. If I want to clean it up a little bit, I can put the frequency on this side. Frequency is equal to speed of light divided by lambda. So all I need to do for this problem, put the speed of light on top of the fraction and then divide by the wavelength underneath. Um, and the only trick here, which you should remember because we've done it enough, is that if you're using numbers, in scientific notation like these are. So they give you the speed of light in scientific notation, and they give you your wavelength in scientific notation. Um, these numbers need to be in brackets when you're putting it in the calculator. So this one should go on top in brackets, that one should go on bottom in brackets, and then when you hit enter, you should get an answer that matches up to one of the answer choices you have there. Let's see. Uh, next one, 25 was the next one I spotted. People had some issues with number 25. So here we are. Number 25 is a, um, a electron configuration question. And this was pretty tough. Uh, a lot of people struggled with this while we were doing it. And it's been a while since we've done it. So it's not shocking that, that this is one of the questions y'all had some issues on. So just to recover this, the thing that you want to do is use this image in conjunction with your periodic table. This image is like the map for you to find your element on your periodic table. So what I'm seeing here, just to refresh my memory, is the S block is just two columns. So I see that I only have two block, two boxes in the S block. It's two columns. So on the periodic table, the S block has to be these first two columns, the orange column and the yellow column. Um, and then I see on the bottom here my F row is just two rows, I have 4F and 5F. So the only part of the periodic table that has two rows is the bottom two, the green and the gold here. Uh, so that is my F block at the bottom and the green and gold. And then I get to my D block. 
Uh, you might remember that the D block is the pink part in the middle where all my transition metals are. Uh, and so that is D. And then the P block in the purple is all the way to the right side. And so this square over here um, with boron and neon at the corners is my P block square. So the whole point of this is I want to take this electron configuration that they gave me and I want to find out what element that is. And in order to do that, I need to put it on a specific place in the periodic table. So the last thing that uh, they write is what I'm concerned with. I'm concerned with the 5D7. Um, that 5D7 tells me exactly where my element is. So the D tells me it's in the D block. Um, so I know it's got to be in the D block right here. So on my periodic table, I know it's somewhere in this pink box of elements in my transition metal. So um, I know it's in the D block. I know it needs to be in row 5D. So I find 5D on the map. And I see in the D block, it's the third row down. Um, so the first top row in the D block is 3D. And then the next one is 4D. And then the third one down is 5D. And the 7 as an exponent, 5D to the seventh power, um, tells me how many elements I need to count over. So in that 5D row, I'm going to count over seven elements. Um, and so I started that little gold box that says 51 to 7 or 57 to 71, and then I'm gonna count over seven boxes. Uh, one, two. Well, actually, I start with that one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, and so the element I see is iridium, I R. And you can see that that's an answer choice for A. Uh, and so that's what I'm looking for there. For the the electron configurations, it's all about the very last number set that you have, number slash letter set. Um, so I'm looking at that 5D7. I find the 5D row, count over seven. That leads me to my element. And it's almost the same for the question before. The question before, they give you the element and they ask you for the electron configuration. And all you have to do is find that element, figure out what block it's in, what row it's in, and count over how many you have. Uh, and so we quickly see that sulfur, which is right here on the periodic table, has to be in the P block, so I know it's going to end with a P. Um, it's in the second row down in the P block, so I know it's 3P. And if I count over, it's the fourth element over in the 3P row. So it should end with 3P4, and instantly that gets us down to F or G. Um, and so to know the difference between these, you just look and see, am I getting all my stuff all the way up to 3P? Uh, G is the only one that also has all the other all the other electron configurations that we need. So let's see what's next. Uh, 29 and 30. 29 and 30. So these are electron dot. Nope, 29 and 30 are some uh, radiation questions. So 29, let's take a look at 29. 29 should just be top math and bottom math. So you have a little equation here. Um, treat the arrow as an equal sign and just do your math from the top numbers separate from the bottom numbers. So what I see here is, let's get a little close up on this. What I see here is my top numbers are 59 is equal to zero plus what? Or if I say it backwards, that helps. What? plus zero is equal to 59. It's got to be 59. And then what plus negative one is equal to 26. So because it's a negative one, I need to go higher than 26. So it should be 27. 27 plus negative one is equal to 26. So I'm looking for an answer that has 59 on top, 27 on bottom. And I see that there are two answers that have that. 59 and 27 could be B or C. Then I go to my periodic table and find out what element it should be. And I see that the 27th element is cobalt. So an element with 27 protons has to be cobalt. So the answer should be C instead of B. So 59, 27 cobalt should be my answer for 29. Now let's check out 30. 30 is going to have the same type of question. They just have a little bit more data for you here. So... For 30, what are they asking? Um, they're asking about beta radiation. Beta radiation, blank. So what about beta radiation? 
So you want to look at your answers and confirm or deny this. So F, beta radiation is particles with less mass than gamma radiation. So we look at the mass of the particle. You see that gamma has no mass um, and beta radiation has some. It's really small, but it's, it's not less than no mass. Uh, it can't be less than no mass. So it's not F. G emits smaller particles than alpha radiation. That's going to be the size. Uh, and actually, I guess you could use mass with that as well. Uh, so alpha radiation has the biggest particle. It's 4 AMUs. Beta radiation is much smaller. So it's not G either. Um, H has less ability to penetrate objects than alpha radiation. Well, alpha radiation's penetrating power is low, while beta's is medium. So medium's not less than low. Medium is more than low. So it's got to be J, but we can double check it. Um, J is not attracted to electrodes. Wait, that's not true either. Oh, it's G. I thought about it wrong. Uh, I don't think anybody's listening to me. It's maybe in the back there. Good job, good job. Uh, it was G. I thought about G wrong. So emits smaller particles than alpha radiation. That is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alpha is four AMUs and beta is less than that. It's like one two thousandths. So beta is smaller than alpha. It needs to be G. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking there. But F, H, and J are not correct. Uh, and so we know it's got to be G. Let's see. What do we have next? Number 40. So we go all the way to number 40. I'll do well in the next section. Well, let me finish this one. I got a couple more left. Uh, and then I'll, I'll go to the second review. Because uh, right here, number 40, really 40 through 48, uh, it didn't look like people were doing too well on these. So let's see. 40, what do they went from? Uh, that's a blank page almost. Our info there. Uh, choose the correct name for PTO. So I have platinum and I have oxygen and I need to name this. Um, so the first thing I want to look at is where platinum and oxygen is on the periodic table. I see that platinum is a metal. It's here in the transition metals. Oxygen is a non-metal. So if it's a metal, non-metal, it's got to be an ionic bond. Um, I remember that from earlier in the semester. So I know I'm looking at this ionic part up here. Um, once I get to the ionic bond, the question is, is it binary? Or is it polyatomic? Um, you can see that it's binary. These aren't complicated elements up here or chemicals. I just have a platinum and I have an oxygen. Single elements, binary. So what they tell us to do, uh, well, we don't need to cross and drop. This is actually for writing the formulas. I need to name them. Um, so the name is going to be the monatomic cation plus the monatomic anion. So if we think back to naming with this, um, you leave the platinum just like it is, and you call the oxygen oxide. And so if you come down here to the answer choices, you see that we have a couple answer choices. They're all platinum oxide. So then the question is, do we need the Roman numeral or not? Um, and the truth is, we do need the Roman numeral, because if you look up at this chart, Platinum, wherever platinum is, it's actually on the second or third row down. It's not on here. Platinum's part of this transition box that has multiple charges. Um, all sorts of elements in here have multiple charges. And so what we're looking for is to see what charge our platinum needs to be. If we come over here to the board, we can see that when we have our formula, it is PTO2. PTO2. So I have a platinum and an oxygen. When I look at oxygen on the periodic table, I see that it has six out of eight electrons. And so I should know that oxygen is going to be a negative two as an ion. So I have a negative two for my oxygen. I have two oxygens, so I actually have two negative twos. And so total here, the oxygen represents a charge of negative four. Um, so my platinum has to equal that out. In ionic bonds, I need the same number of positives as I do negatives. And so if I only have one platinum, that platinum has to be 
a plus four platinum. So when I write it out, I want the whole name platinum Roman numeral four oxide. And that's the way they want that one written. And so that should be an answer choice. And we see that it is. So let's see, let's see, what else we have? Another one of the naming compounds. With this one, you do have a polyatomic ion, which is your NH4 and your SO4. And so you actually have to look those up. Um, NH4 is ammonium, SO4 is sulfate. And so it should be ammonium sulfate. And that should be the only thing that you have. And you see that is an answer there, ammonium sulfate. Number eight. Okay, I'll do that first. Which wasn't one that a bunch of people got, but because you're asking, I'll do it. And then a bunch of people got wrong. Well, let's see. Uh, so let's do 45 through 48. So 45, select the chemical formula for sulfur trioxide. So we know it's got to have what two elements in it. If I can go back up. Uh, it's got to have sulfur, got to have oxygen. Um, and the tri should tell me exactly how many oxygens I have. Um, it should be three oxygens. Um, because I don't have anything in front of the sulfur, that should just be one. So sulfur trioxide should be SO3. That's... It's one that a bunch of y'all got wrong. I'm sure got that. A bunch of people got that wrong. Okay. Uh, 46, the dots. I did have a lot of questions about these. Um, basically, you're going to use the periodic table to solve this one. So the idea is you want to find both of these elements. Um, I see that the sodium is in that first column on the periodic table in the orange, and that should only have one valence electron around it. So the sodium and my answer should only have one dot around it at the very beginning. That's the way it starts out. Um, so now I have it eliminated down to G or J because um, H is wrong and F is wrong. Then I look at the chlorine. I find chlorine on the periodic table. It's in the seventh column with the halogens. And so it should have only seven out of eight electrons, not the full eight. And so if I count these here, I see that both J and G have the chlorine as having seven electrons. So one electron for sodium, seven for chlorine. Um, the sodium's a metal, and the chlorine is a non-metal, and so that should form an ionic bond. And we know in ionic bonds, our electron actually moves over to the other element, and I want to see that happen. So here at G is the correct way that that happens. My sodium has lost its electron. Um, that dot has gone over to chlorine, so now sodium doesn't have any dots. The chlorine has a full eight. And because that electron is moved, I have charges now. Where I've lost an electron, I have a positive charge. Where I've gained an electron, I have a negative charge. And so this should be answer choice G, your sodium and your chloride. Uh, let's look at the next one, 47. The key to 47 is how many dots does carbon have around it as a valence electron? Um, and so if we look at the periodic table, and you count over, you should see that carbon is in the fourth row here. So I count the first row with hydrogen, second row with beryllium, third row with boron, and then my fourth row has carbon. So carbon as a Lewis dot structure should be a C with four dots around it. And so I know once I start to put stuff in here, um, like they show me in my problem, there are hydrogens all around here. So I have some hydrogen here, some hydrogen here, hydrogen here. I know that I only have one more electron that can bond over here. And so it doesn't matter what I want to do, there can only be one bond here. If there were a double bond, now my carbon would have 10 electrons around the outside, and that's not allowed. So the only thing that can happen here is a single bond between the carbons. Uh, and so the answer choice should be single bond A. Uh, what's next? 48. SiH4. So this is pretty much the same thing that we did on the last problem. The SI is just below the carbon. 
it should only have four dots around it, and so it can only have four bonds. Um, so your hydrogens are going to go one for each bond, um, and they're not going to have any extra dots left over. So the correct answer for 48 should be G. Uh, let's see, 49. Select the Lewis structure for NCl3. Um, the key here is you want to look at your nitrogen. Um, your nitrogen should have five dots around it, and that will kind of give you the shape. And so if we start from the top and work clockwise, I put my nitrogen in, and I have five dots. One, two, three, four, five. And so when it comes to time to attach my three chlorines, I know that the chlorines have to attach to these single electrons, my bonding electrons. Um, the ones up top are a non-bonding pair. So my chlorines are going to come out here. And the chlorines should also have extra dots around them. And so that should be the shape of my molecule. The nitrogen in the middle and the chlorines around the outside. Uh, and so we see that should be A. I think that's it. Oh, 50. What's wrong with the oxygen picture? Uh, I think everybody got that. So let's go to test number one. How much time we have left? Not too bad. 41. Got a little bit. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'll do eight. Let me check on five. Uh, so five, I might change five and make it a little bit easier. This is kind of tough for a balancing problem. Um, but the key here is you want to try to balance it. Um, so start by writing down the formula. Or if you just want to use your test as scratch paper, um, start to throw some coefficients in here. Try to balance it. Count your elements from left to right, uh, comparing on either side of the arrow. Um, but when I try to help a student with it yesterday, um, basically, we had a 4 here with our HNO3. Um, so that matches up with answers B and C. But with that 4 there, I couldn't get it balanced out. Um, it, it was really hard to get it balanced out, and it wasn't working. So having that 4 there didn't get me to the correct answer. So with that 4, I know that B and C are incorrect um, because it, there, would, there should have been an easy way to get there with that 4, and there wasn't. So that lost my confidence in B and C. I know they're not correct. So now the question is, is it D or A? And if I look at D or A, A is actually just double what D is. Um, they took all the same numbers and they just doubled them. 3 to 6, 8 to 16, 4 to 8, and 2 to 4. So even if A was right, D would be a better choice because I could reduce it down. Um, and so my last step, just to double check, uh, I throw all these coefficients in front of the chemicals uh, and check it out for D. And when I plug my coefficients in, I balance everything. I check it. It's all balanced. Um, and so D should be the correct answer for five. Although when I go in and, and spruce up the test, I'll probably change that to a little different one. Um, seven, real quick, consider the reaction. The reaction can be classified as what type of reaction? Oh, maybe if you're having trouble with these, which it seems like some people are, um, Go to that study sheet on types of reactions, and they will have a nice breakdown of what your reaction should look like. Um, for number seven, what, I look, what I'm seeing is I have two chemicals at the beginning and two chemicals at the end. And at the beginning and the end, both chemicals on both sides have multiple elements. So like the first one is hydrogen and iodine. Um, then I have sodium, oxygen, and hydrogen. Then I have sodium and iodine and hydrogen and oxygen. So all of these chemicals are polyatomic chemicals. They have multiple atoms. Um, and what that tells me is when I have something switch, like basically what's going to happen, my hydrogen and my uh, sodium are going to switch places. The hydrogen takes the sodium's place. The sodium takes the hydrogen place. That has to be double replacement. Um, and when you go and look at the study sheet, you see that both chemicals have two elements each, um, at least, that kind of gives you that shape of the equation, and you see that it's double replacement. So number eight is going to be the same thing. Uh, number eight, you want to look at that, uh, that study sheet to kind of see how the different reactions are happening. And the first thing I see with number eight is oxygen here. 
Um, and so anytime I use oxygen in a, in a equation, um, especially when I have CO2 and H2O as my products, um, I know that there's one thing that needs oxygen to kind of exist, and that is, well, obviously life, but uh, fires. Fires need oxygen. Um, and so when I see that oxygen just as a reactant by itself, that's going to tell me it's probably combustion. Um, it can't be single replacement because over here in my products, I don't have an element that's all by itself. Um, it's not double replacement because the oxygen's all by itself. And it's not synthesis or decomposition because I have two chemicals on both sides of the arrow. Um, so really the only thing that is left by, by a process of elimination has to be combustion. Um, which, sorry, it's not actually what the question is asking. Uh, I spent a lot of time on that. That's not what the question is asking. So this is stoichiometry. Uh, so what are they asking us for? Sorry, I just was in, in the zone, and it was the wrong zone. Uh, so what they give you is moles, and what are they asking you for? Moles. So uh, I guess I don't have it pulled up anymore, but I did yesterday. Uh, where is my stoichiometry flow chart? Here. No, that's the astrogometry. Where is it? Hold on. I lost it yesterday. I know. All these are so, and I'm so unorganized on my desktop. It's terrible. Uh, let me go to sampling real quick. I'm just open it. And it's going to be chapter eight, seven, seven sheets per gallon. Okay. So what we're looking at for this one is they give us moles and they ask us to go to moles. This is a moles to moles problem. So what's the only thing we need? Yes, the mole ratio, which is B over A. So if I go back to my test, B over A, chemical A is always the one that I start with. So oxygen is my chemical A. Um, chemical B is the one I'm always answering in. So C2H6 is my chemical B. So I have B over A. So my ratio is going to be B over A, which is 2 over 7. So 2 over 7 is my mole ratio. I take my moles that I start with, multiply by 2 over 7, and that should get me directly to my answer. So there's really only one step, and that is the mole ratio. Wherever that happens, go. Here it is. This right here. Cool. So now let's see. We've got eight done. So what I would always do, I'm always going to start with the number they give me. They're only going to give me one number. So I only have one place that I can start with. It's a certain number of moles, right? So they give me moles, and they ask me to go to moles. So I look at my flow chart. I'm starting at moles, and I'm going to moles. So I only have one step that I have to do. That's the mole ratio. And the mole ratio is B over A. So the ending chemical on top, the beginning chemical on bottom. So when I come back and look at my problem, the chemical they give me the number with is my starting chemical. That's oxygen. My ending chemical is C2H6. So that's my chemical B. That's my chemical A, B over A. So when I go to my formula, that's where I get these numbers from, my coefficients in my formula. Chemical B has a 2 in front of it. Chemical A has a 7 in front of it. So my fraction should be 2 over 7, right? So what I have to do now is just take my starting number, and multiply by that fraction, 2 over 7. So multiply by 2, divide by 7. That should get me directly to the answer. So let's see. 9 and 10, I guess everybody did all right with. 11 was the next one that a bunch of people missed. Um, okay, so 11 is where we start to get into gas laws. So the first thing I see on 11 is they give me an initial... 
volume. Adding helium to a balloon increased its volume from this. So if I'm, I'm increasing from that, I know that's what it was at the beginning. So I have a volume here, and then I have a volume here. So volume one and volume two. So if I have a one and two, I know that I'm working over here in my combined gas law, because uh, it has the ones and twos. The ideal gas law doesn't have any ones and twos, so that's when I'm not getting multiples of my answer. So ones and twos right here, but they don't give me everything. They give me a volumes, and they give me a single mole. They don't give me any temperatures, and they don't give me any pressures. So I can just ignore the temperatures and the pressures. I get rid of the P's and I get rid of the T's, and all I have left is the volumes and the moles. And so this is my formula for that problem. V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. I just have to plug everything in. Um, the only trick for this one is my volumes are in different, uh, different units. So I need to turn my milliliters into a liter. I need to move my decimal three times to the left. It would be 0.887 and 4.65. So I plug those in. Um, they give me the final number of moles. So this is moles 2, and they ask what was the initial number of moles, which is moles 1. I plug everything into the formula, and I should be able to get to the answer, uh, which I guess I'll do it real quick. So it's going to be moles 2 times volume 1. So point. 937 times 0.887 and then divide by volume two 4.65 and I got 0.1787 which round up to 0.179 so that's how you go about that uh number 13 let's see Number 13, Carla is trying to understand Chris Charles's law, the experiment balloon. So you know it's going to be Charles's law. Um, they give me an initial temperature and a final temperature. So temperature one, temperature two. I got to remember to add 273 to both of these. Uh, and then they give me a final volume, and they're asking for the initial volume or the original volume of the balloon. So I just need to plug this in again. Um, but instead of moles, I'm using temperatures. Temperature one, temperature two. Uh, so I just need to remember to convert my temperatures to Celsius, plug in one and two, uh, plug in my volume two, and solve for volume one by cross multiplying. And so that one should not be that bad. Um, maybe just make sure you remember to add that 273 for your degree Celsius. Let's see, at what temperature do 273 moles and... Okay, now 14, uh, they didn't ask to do 14, or it wasn't one that a bunch of y'all missed, but I'll point out on 14, they stopped giving you initial and final moles and pressure and temperature. They just give you one of each. So that then is when you translate or transfer over to... The PB equals NRT, uh, the ideal gas law instead of combining. Let's see, number 18. Oh, that one way too fast. Uh, yes, I'm going to do 18 through 22. So let's take a look at it. How about 24? Can you do 20 to 22? Sure. Let's see. So let's take a look at them. Uh, 18 real quick. Oh, it's terrible. Here we go. Uh, 18, volume exerted by gas, volume one, volume two, pressure one. So this is just volume and pressure using the combined gas law. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any tricks on this one. Uh, 19, same thing, temperature and pressure, you're going to use the combined gas law. Just make sure you add 273 to it. Let's take a look at 20. During the reaction provided, methane gas reacts with water vapor to produce carbon monoxide. Determine how many liters of gas are produced. 51 liters of gas is measured 
at STP are reactive. Okay, for these, um, so first off, for these stoichiometry problems, I will have more images here in the test uh, because basically there probably should be like a, a gas stoichiometry image. I don't have it pulled up right now, but it's, it's basically this one that we had that also had the volume stuff. So instead of multiplying by Avogadro's number here, we had like the times 22.4 to go from liters to moles and back from moles to liters. Um, so I will actually have that one up on the test for you. But basically for 20, what you want to be able to do is look at one of these charts, know where you're starting and where you're ending. Um, and as long as you can follow the directions and use the mole ratio, you should be able to get there. Um, it's just going to be like a stoichiometry problem. So for example, if I can remember off the top of my head for this one, 52.1 liters, and you want to go to liters of hydrogen gas. Um, actually, for this one, I think the only thing you'd need to do is the mole ratio. Um, so you make a mole ratio from CH4 as your chemical A to hydrogen as your chemical B. So A, B, so it would be uh, B over A. So yeah, B over A should be 3 over 1. So I'm going to take my starting number, 52.1 liters, and multiply by that mole ratio, 3 over 1, and that should be how many liters of hydrogen I get out the other side. Uh, because you're at STP, it gets, it gets pretty easy. So, uh, yeah, so I will put that, that little like flow chart image up there, and that should be quite a big help. Uh, let's see. 21, consider reaction minute, how many liters of gas? Atmosphere needed to be reacted. Yeah, nice. All right, so this is at STP. This is going to be kind of the same thing, um, except they give you moles and they're asking for liters. So you'll do the mole ratio, and then I think you multiply by 22.4. Um, but I'll have the flow chart on there. 23 is going to be very similar. What did you ask for? 23 or 24? 23. Uh, let's see, let's see, oxygen gas, anybody to that. So they give you grams of potassium chloride, and they want to know what volume of oxygen you would get. So this is just going to be another stoichiometry problem. Uh, I'll have the flow chart on there, and you'll go from grams here to volume here. So what you're going to have to do, divide by the molar mass, use the mole ratio, and then multiply by 22.4. Um, and so just mentally get ready for seeing some of these on the test and just being able to follow that flow chart uh, and that should get you to the end. All right, know that I'm about, I'm going to post this online. Um, if you want to redo a review, come in during activity period or just come in uh, to study a little bit and get ready for the test. Test is tomorrow.